Hello, uh, I'm Harry, your host at Epistemi Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to, to great entrepreneurs and who uh, help them also to, to, to make their dream come true. Uh, today, it's my pleasure to receive uh, Dr. Ali Parande Zanfu. He's a PhD in biotechnology who left the academic world 20 years ago, or maybe more, to embrace the life of an entrepreneur in the IT world. Dr. Parande is a serial entrepreneur. He's notably the founder uh, and CEO of, uh, of Urbitus, a cloud platform and software the service that helps manage residential communities. Dr. Parande is also an angel investor in several startups and he is a passionate mentor for brilliant young entrepreneurs. How are you today, Dr. Parande? Ari, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, I'm very well. Uh, and it's a lovely day. It's getting warm and summer is starting. So starting to enjoy a little bit of the summer. So you're based in Spain, right? I'm based in southern Spain, yes. So you're a fantastic uh, place to, to live and, and to, to, to do business with, uh, with uh, to create uh, great, great, uh, great opportunities, right? Absolutely, absolutely. It's uh, it's a part of paradise. So I call our little planet Earth. I call it paradise, and I'm in a beautiful part of paradise. Fantastic. Uh, Could you please uh, uh, talk about your your path? You know, from the stem. Why did you study stem first of all, uh, and why biology? Why did you commit to to to, to the research and get a PhD and then? Why did you did you let the academy world and, and the promising career that you mm. that was that was uh, opening to you in, in the academy, you know, doing research, becoming a professor, and you commit into the into entrepreneurship and launching your own company? Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, I I think it starts somewhere around in 1985. In 1985, I we had just moved to Spain, and I remember the Amstrad 6128. I don't know whether you remember it or not, very few people would remember. It's uh, nearly 30 odd years ago. The Amstrad 6128 was created by Amstrad. It, it had a three inch floppy drive and it had 128 kilobyte of memory. That's all it had. Uh, no hard disk, it had 128 kilobyte. That's why it was called the Amstrad 6128. And I, I started programming with that computer. I fell in love with computers and I had asked my father, you know, to buy me this computer and I will do whatever he says. You, you were in high school at that time or already? I was in high school, oh, yeah. Okay. I was at the first year of Olivals, uh, the English school. So the, the, the computer was basically, you know, you switched it on and it switched on with basic the language basic, if you remember it. Mm. And the booklet that came with it was in Spanish. It was a thick booklet. And I, I remember I spoke no Spanish. So I started just typing whatever I could see that was in English into this computer. And it would just, you know, respond uh, a few things. Some of their commands would work. Some of them would not work. Print and hello and, you know, print screen. <laughs> so but, but, uh, you know, no, we, we love but people send, send other people on the moon with this kind of basic programmation. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so I, I, I started programming and I started falling in love with programming. And I, in particularly, I love databases. So between the age of, uh, I would say 15 and 18, I, I had this computer. I would spend my days, nights, summers, uh, holidays, programming and writing programs for my parents, address books and shopping lists. It probably would have taken my mother a lot, you know, less time to look up the phone book in the address book <laughs> or, or the phone in the address book than, than on the computer. But, you know, I nevertheless wrote it and I insisted that they should use the computer. <laughs> so I that, that was my sort of introduction to the world of computers and I really wanted to carry on but I, I think you're Iranian so you understand me when I say my parents didn't understand computers in those days and they thought computers is just a you know probably a piece of game or a machine and it's not really the future they wanted me to become 
uh, doctor of medicine or an engineer and they thought you know this is this is the real world this is the real stuff where you're going to make money and where you're going to be able to support your family so they they pushed me into you know going into studying either engineering or you know hardcore science and i i was also intrigued intrigued because i was studying biology i was intrigued by i can write a program and at that time, you know, we, the code of life, they, they, knew, they knew about DNA and biology had already discovered the double helix. And it always intrigued me if, uh, you know, I can write the program, who wrote the program for us? So this is why I actually decided to leave. I, I enrolled to do mechanical engineering uh, for, for university. And immediately, as soon as I got accepted, I changed back to biotechnology, which was genetic engineering, which was studying the code of life, code of you know everything that is alive. And I was really, really intrigued by what we can change, how it is coded, where it comes from, and who wrote it. <laughs> uh, I, I still don't know who wrote the program. I don't know who programmed <laughs> us, <laughs> but I know I know a little bit more than most other people. So that, that's why I went into the world of genetics and I did my bachelor's degree and I worked in plant biotechnology and I did my PhD working on uh, lactic acid bacteria, which uh, are involved in the production of yogurt. Mm -hmm. In particularly the bacteria I worked with were involved in production of a polysaccharide, which has anti-carcinogen anti effect and also used as food preservative. So it would have been a very good natural product for using in food preservative rather than the other synthetic ones that were currently being used in the market. So there I learned about cloning, I learned about you know manipulating genes, and it was ever so interesting. But by the time I was finishing my PhD, I realized the time in being able to achieve things in genetics is uh, like 10 times longer than any other programming jobs. Mm. So with programming, you know, you can sit there three months, six months or a year and you can write a huge program and it will work. It may have bugs, but you can fix the bugs. Mm. With genetics, it was not as simple as that. And in those days, a lot of the things were manual. I mean, we used to like, you know, write, uh, do electrophoresis and a whole lot of these things and all these PCR test kits that they talk about now. My God, I remember in those days, a PCR would easily take us, you know, two, three days. Yeah. So, and, and the enzyme was really, really expensive. If you remember, <laughs> you know, the Perkin Elmer uh, DNA TAC polymerase. Uh, so when I finished my, you know, uh, postgraduate degree and doctorate, then I went to Iran. I worked uh, with another guy on, uh, we, we set up a company called Iran Biotech Industries. And it, it was really him. He had cloned TAC DNA polymerase, believe it or not. And in Iran, we produced and we sold TAC DNA, DNA polymerase to the laboratories in Iran that were doing research. But, was it, uh, I don't remember, but was it this, this, this enzyme uh, patented by, I don't know, an American company? Or, never. So you did it as a hacker, you know? Right? Well, uh, the patent was uh, in most countries, apart from Iran and a number of other countries. Oh, okay. mm -hmm. So we were free to clone it if we achieve it ourselves. And that's exactly what uh, uh, Abbas, my partner, managed to do. He managed to clone it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, doing his own research and his own findings. And we, we were able to produce TAC DNA polymerase uh, at a reasonable uh, cost and production, but uh, of course, in those days, the use was very, very limited mm. to laboratories. So the revenue was comparatively compared to today. Had we kept the company today, I could have been a billionaire. But <laughs> with all these PCR tests that they do, but you know, in in those days, it was very little. So we sold the company in the end uh, for you know a small share uh, and. We, we managed to get some returns and I, I went back to what was really my passion. My passion was IT, my passion was computers, 
programming and the internet had just started opening up. If you if you know me, because it's, it's the first time I see, because we know each other, so people. Yeah. Uh, it's the first time I hear you saying that you compare the, the, the duration of changing something with genetics and the duration of changing something with, with the with the IT coding, you know, programmation. And this is something that is the first time I hear I hear it from you because comparing these two to the way of changing the world was a determinant factor to push you to come back to IT. The, the, the speed the, to, to it, the speed of doing things. Absolutely. It was one of the factors. It was one of the factors. The, I, I would say the primary factor, Ari, was passion. Mm. Uh, passion and love. I, I love computers. I love the internet. I love technology. And I, I think this is actually what really uh, moved me to come back to, to IT world. And the, the, one of the books, the last book and last book that I'm writing is uh, called Passion and Vision, The Ingredients for a Successful Startup. Because over all these years, one thing that I come to realize is that when you're when you're following your passion, you virtually don't need to put any extra energy. It doesn't cost you energy. Uh, if you work until two in the morning, you just enjoy it. You you're doing it because you love it. You're not doing it because you have to do it. And the work turns into something you love and you enjoy life. And it's there's no struggle in it anymore. And everything works because you're in the flow. And I so much believe in the universal power as well. So I, I very much, you know, when I sit down with entrepreneurs, I equally tell them, look, what is it you really love doing? What is it you really want to do in life? What is it that your heart says? And you, you just got to follow your heart. And that is that is why I moved back in 97, uh, you know, 98 to, to IT. And I've continued this path uh, so far. And it and it has paid off, and it has paid off. I have to say. So just after you sold your biotech company in Iran, uh, what was the next step? So I I I was during while I while we had the uh, I, the biotech company in Iran, I also did consultancy in Iran, and I was working in internet issues, and you know uh, working with a number of government companies uh, or institutes, uh, helping them with. Uh, setting up their internet services and emails and uh, I wrote five books uh, during that time the welcome to internet the final second internet for business internet for research and I also wrote introduction to genetics and biotechnology so this is what I did between 97 and 2000 2001 then in 2001 I decided to leave Iran and I came back here to Spain and in Spain, I set up PC Doctor. Mm. So again, very much in line with IT world. And uh, here's again a very good, uh, I would say, lesson for entrepreneurs, because I came from Iran. And in Iran, I was doing consultancy. I wasn't doing anything else. So I thought, OK, I come to Spain and I do consultancy and you know write reports and do things. So I, uh, for probably best part of six months to a year, I advertise. Uh, in various newspapers and magazines, IT consultant, and these are my background, these are my expertise. Uh, and I virtually had maybe three calls. Uh, and in, in these three calls, the clients, all they wanted was their computers fixed. Mm. And during that time, while I was here, my friends also would call me, oh, Ali, you know about computers. Can you help us fix this? Can, you know, my computer's crashed and can you tell me what to buy? And can you tell me what the best printer is or whatever? So suddenly, you know, the idea of PC doctor came along and I thought, okay, I'm a doctor. I'll, you know, I'll be the PC <laughs> doctor. And boom, it took off. Uh, within, you know, a couple of months, you know, phone calls were coming in. And then I started realizing that it was the beginning of the ADSL era when, you know, people were getting connected with ADSL. And there was a lot of issues with connectivity, with the modems, and few people really understood. The telephone companies would come and install these things. And, you know, sometimes they could get it working, sometimes they couldn't. And when they couldn't get it working, they would just leave it there and go. <laughs> and people were desperate to get connected. 
So I realized there's a market because I saw that, you know, there, there are a lot of people who are crying for help in, you know, uh, newspapers complaining and in dinner parties we went to. So I created another cat advertising called ADSL Helpline. And boom, it, it was just amazing. And of course, I knew routers inside. I knew what an IP address is. To me, it was second nature. I, you know, it was so easy for me to do these things. So and at that time, there was also the boom of personal computing. You know, people had their yes. own Dell and etc. So the need of a such service was booming, right? Completely, completely. The need was there. The sector was growing. The demand was there. Was there. People wanted, wanted yourself. Yes. Yes, and people were getting internet connections and ADSLs and... So you started, uh, you were alone or do you have a co-founder at that time? No, in, in Electron Box I was alone. So okay. PC Doctor, I, I set up as a company Electron Box PC Doctor and I sold that company three years ago. So I grew that company to, uh, we went up to 15 people at one point. Wow. I had a service company, a contract with the local telephone company. Telefonica. So I, as a subcontract, I did all their installations locally. We, we did all their support calls locally. And we, we did really, really well. Uh, and in between that time, I came across this idea of Orbitus, which mm. was, again, my love, because I loved programming. I, I, I adore programming, and I love databases. I love putting everything in structures. Uh, boxes are, you know, everything <laughs> in a box. <laughs> so when when I became the president of my community back in 2000, and I think it was seven or eight, I then decided, oh my God, this is an absolute mess and chaos. You know, everybody's got email, everybody's no, got it. Okay, because you have, to, you have to explain what is community, because the first time we met and you just Send me the picture of your, your stuff it was three years ago. I didn't get what what was because in French we don't have communities as you have in Spain. So I didn't I didn't understand what understand community, community. Is that, okay. you say just what is community? Right, fantastic. Okay. So well uh there, there there's in, in the old days, you and I, uh, I remember, you know, probably if we go back to Tehran, we all lived in a house, and, you know, one house per street, well, not per street, or one house uh, per, family. per family, and, you know, the next house, and then the next house. So they were individual houses, and more or less at that time, it also started, you know, the boom of the urbanizations, where the houses were knocked down, and they built apartment blocks to fit obviously more people into one block of uh, land. So the minute you have an apartment block, uh, that apartment block shares an entrance door, shares the staircases, shares the electricity for the staircases. There's a cleaner, there's a gardener, sometimes there's a shared swimming pool. Therefore there's shared areas and communities, uh, communal areas and then costs and maintenance. This forms a community. Okay, because in French we say we have the same thing that we call it syndicate. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, in in America it's known as homeowners association. Okay, homeowners association. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So different places call it differently, but the problem and the, you know, the issue is common worldwide. Mm -hmm. The minute you have more than two properties on one piece of land, it becomes shared costs, and they have to share the costs. And then it requires a management. Obviously, two properties, you know, they deal between themselves. Uh, but the minute it goes more than five, six, or ten, it requires a lot more management. And now we have apartment blocks. Usually, you know, they house twenty or forty minimum uh, as uh, households mm. in one block. So uh, the idea, uh, your just how, right. how, how did it emerge in your mind? Uh, did you face yourself the problem in your community where you live? Uh, or, or, or was it something more opportunist? I mean, you, you observe, you know, uh, working uh, the community. Uh, how, how, does it, how did it emerge in okay. your mind? So I, I became the president. So each community mm -hmm. then selects, a, you know, committee. Uh, really, yeah. Committee to you know do all the jobs and oversee all the accounts and how much expenses, and there's always a president, just like a government in okay. a country. 
uh, community is no different. So but you, you were uh, you were living in the in the, in the building, right? Exactly. Okay. I, I had bought an apartment in a community and I became the president. So I became the leading uh, person in this community. And that is where I realized, oh my God, they're doing everything on paper. <laughs> All the communications are delivered by paper and put into post boxes. And I thought, why waste so much paper? You know, when a simple email can inform everybody. And why, you know, uh, I, I was given, when I became the president, I was given a folder this thick uh, with papers uh, about the previous president and all the things that had to be done and all the things pending. I thought, what do I do with this? You know, where do I start? <laughs> this will take me more than four, you know, one year to read it. <laughs> so this so, is a very important teaching for entrepreneurs. When you face a problem yourself, uh, it's an opportunity to make a business with it. Absolutely, absolutely. I think it's actually one of the best ways to to solve a problem is when you face a problem, uh, and it, it, it is the best way to go about you know becoming an entrepreneur mm. because you're living it day to day, mm -hmm. and you think, okay, I create this to solve this problem, and tomorrow there's another problem, and then you have to decide, okay, is this problem common to me? or common to everybody yeah. that is in this situation. And if you're then going to create a tool, you've constantly got to ask this question, is it common to me or is it you know, to everybody? Is it just for me or common to everybody? This is the difference between uh, an engineering problem and a business problem. You know, Sometimes engineer lack to solve just the problem, but when you uh, uh, step a little bit you know, uh, back to see, and you see that there is, it's a very local problem, it's a very technical problem solved, but there is no uh, potential, a business potential. And this is very important, you know, to do the zoom in, the zoom out, zoom in, the zoom out uh, to the problem and see if there is a, it is worth to, to make it a business. True, true. And, you know, well, well said, because if we don't do this, this is where we end up creating and building a personal tool mm -hmm. that exactly. has no use other than for ourselves. And how did you do this Zoom in Zoom out? Did you went to other community interviewing other presidents of community in, in other city, or how did you do your your market research at that time? Yeah, L luckily I had uh, around me where I live. There's loads of apartments blocks and there's loads of organizations, which is basically communities of uh, owners and property owners, and they uh, some of these their presidents were my friends. So I started with them. I would ask them, you know, is this problem common to you? Do you do you have this problem? Do you have that problem? And based on what they would say, and they would say, oh, well, we also need this. We also need this. And if four or five of them agreed on the same problem, then I would build that module and implement it. And at that time, when you launched uh, uh, when people launch an IT startup, they do it uh, without the tools that we have today, you know, the, the lean startup process and the, the MVP. So uh, did, did you also, maybe uh, you didn't, it was, it, 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 it will come far later, you know, this, this, this wave from the United States. How did you uh, structure your business? Did you, by yourself, did you do some, something like an MVP or did you do the whole thing at the, at the, day, at the day one? No, you know, funnily enough, I, I did it in, in the stages as if it was a lean startup. Mm. Uh, there was, as you say, the book wasn't published. Uh, there, were, there was very little information on the internet about entrepreneurship and uh, these type of things to help you. Uh, even, you know, the, the, the framework that existed uh, for our platform, you know, there was uh, Zend and there was PHP Nuke. So we tried with those and they were so limited that they were not, you know, they were not even good frameworks. So we had, to, we had to do everything from scratch and our own code and our own style. But I, the way I did it was like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna create a small product and if it goes, you know, if, if it is required and if it sells, then we'll add bit by bit what is required by clients, as they go asking, we'll go implementing it. Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, did you, because you, you identified many problems in the community, right? Yeah. But did you choose one to, and try to solve it? Or did you try, I don't know, to, to bring a solution that could, that could be a solution for all the problems? 
how did you how did you manage the, the product development? Okay, the the to be to be honest, the mm. first version I created was a static website. Mm. <laughs> it was a static website where we uploaded the information, uh, which was nothing more than the minutes of the meetings. Mm. That was our yeah. first website, and you know, a couple of photos of the community and description of the community and all of that. Then the next thing that was required, they said, oh well, this is all in the public domain, so we need to make sure it's closed and nobody can see it. So then I password protected the database mm. and the documents. Then the next thing was, oh, well, only one person has password. So then I created a you know, user area where each person could get its own user and pass username and password and log in. So you, dis you discovered uh, the needs of a new future step by step. Mm. It, it was very step by step. and. Uh, to be honest, we did like three versions. So the, the first version we did, you know, one, one year, we did programming and we realized we've made so many mistakes and there's so many things hanging in the air and badly connected that we just totally deleted everything. And we started from a scratch again. And then uh, we started with .NET Nuke this time, uh, the Microsoft, but it was way too heavy and it was way too cumbersome. and. The server was, you know, really expensive. <laughs> so again, we hit delete uh, and we scrapped the server and then we went to a PHP server, you know, PHP MySQL. And in three months, we wrote the basic requirements of what we had learned over the past couple of years. So all we had was an area where users could log in, where we could send a newsletter to all the users and we could upload the uh, documents. That's all there was. So how many times did you, did, you, did you take to bring uh, a solution that worked for your own community? One year, two years? It, it, it took two years. Two years, it took wow. Two years of trials and errors, but mm. we went in stages. I mean, the web, static website was the first MVP, let's say. Yeah. And it was, you know, it, it was what they say, you know, you should do the, the thing that costs the least. Mm -hmm. And we just had a website. It was a static. It did nothing. It took me two days. <laughs> uh, and of course, you know, the response was positive and they wanted it. And it was like, okay, we like it. You know, can we now password protect it? And I thought, okay, then I need to do some more work. So then I did some more work. But as we went along, we realized, okay, we've come so far now, but now, if we want to grow it, if we want to make it something big, it's not you know, going to hold. And that's where we decided, okay, there is a business here, uh, but we got to just do it properly. So that's where we deleted and rewrote the code. And you, the behavior, because what, what, there is three things in, in, in when you have a business idea, there is a problem. Uh, you have also the business opportunity. Does the problem uh, apply to other people? This has become a business opportunity. And there is the third point that usually entrepreneurs uh, um, miss in their, in their analysis is the behavior of people. Some people have the problem. They know they have the problem. They want a solution, but when you bring them the solution, they don't take it because they are conservative, etc. or just they don't have the behavior. What was the behavior of people during your era with the, with the computer and going to, to their computer and logging to the website and using your, your software? Was it, was it at that time already the behavior there, the, the, the hunger to, of using the service there, or did you need to, did you need to evangelize, you know, to, to, to teach them individually, uh, on the flat owner by flat owner to use the solution? Yeah, Ari, you've hit on a wonderful, wonderful topic. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm going to, to tell you about this. I'm going to go back uh, a couple of years. So... When, when, when I came up on the idea of Urbitus, I knew I'm early. Mm. I knew I'm early in the market and I knew the market is not there yet. Mm. And I thought, uh, previously I had many ideas. So I remember in 1994, I told a few friends, look, go, let's go and set up an ISP internet service provider. We sell internet services for people to get connected and we'll make loads of money. And my friend said, oh, you're crazy. Who wants to come to Costa del Sol to go to the beach? You know, they want to go to the beach. <laughs> they don't want internet and they don't want to check their emails. So 
I knew my idea was too early and nobody believed me. So in 1997, when everybody was making money from internet and, you know, internet access, I was like, shit, we missed the boat. Then in 1997, you know, I came up with the idea of eBooks. And luckily in Iran, I had a couple of publishers because I had published five books. I begged them and I managed to convince two of those publishers to convert uh, quite a few of their books to ebooks. Yeah. And I wrote the first Persian ebook. Wow. <laughs> so in 2000, I wrote the first mm-hmm. Persian ebook, the introduction to genetics and biotechnology. But then, of course, it was so early, you know, after two years, uh, both publishers said, look, we haven't sold a single copy. I said, I know, you know, you're just going to wait. You know, this is going to be big. <laughs> <laughs> And they didn't believe me. So they put the plug on that project as well. (laughs) Then in 2001, when I came to Spain, uh, apart from PC Doctor, I I started another project, which was buybycommissions.com. And at that time, uh, the market was in Spain, in the southern Spain, was booming with property sales. Uh, I mean, booming, Uh, not just to Spain, but worldwide. And generally down here, they charged 5% commissions. And I thought that's outrageous. You know, I'll create a website where anybody can put their property up for sale and I'll just charge 250 euros or 199 euros. I can't remember. And of course I did it, but I was way too early. (laughs) And so in 2005, six, seven, when I was coming with this idea of Obertus, uh, I, I knew I'm very too early for this project, but then I thought, hold on, I had this idea, people told me I'm too early and look at where, where it is now. I had the other idea and the next idea and the next idea. So I thought, I know I'm early, but I'm not gonna let go of this because this is going to be the future. So when we started, we, we hit exactly what we say, what you said. Uh, we had this uh, customer behavior, which was uh, a number of things. So the user from the owner perspective, they would use it, they would log in and they would, they liked it and they were happy with the service. The community president who had to decide could not make the decision. They were like, oh, well, we don't know how many people are connected and we don't know how many emails we have. And only we have half the emails of half the property owners. I was like, yeah, but you're gonna get the rest of them. You know, they haven't given it to you because you have no system. So why would they give you their email? It's a social business, you know, social business, uh, it can't work if you're out of the social network. It's like Facebook. If you're, it's the the success of Facebook is based on the social network, you know? um, You you come in and you say other people to come in because you don't want to stay alone. Yeah. So we, we had then the, then the buyer who was the president and the committee, uh, we, we had that hurdle of they weren't sure whether all the owners w- would be able to access it or not. And some people were old, some people didn't have emails. And we, we had that uh, conflict, not conflict, but barrier to entry. How did you manage that? Yeah. And then the other side was the management company, the management companies that manage all these communities. And they are a mafia and a <laughs> world of their own because- Same thing, same thing all around the world. All, all around the world, <laughs> because there's so much money in communities and they take so much from these communities with putting in this invoice and putting in that invoice and putting something on top of their repairs. So they of course did not want any transparency and they don't want any communication you know no communication and no transparency is the best thing for them so we we had a huge hurdle and barrier uh there and uh we when when we started uh we we be, we were ready around 2008 so the third problem we encountered was 2008 2009 was the beginning of the worst recession in Spain. So put those three barriers together, we could not sell. Between 2008 and 2013, I burnt through my cash pile and that's when I met you, if you remember, more or less. I was uh, just, to just, just to remind people, younger people, because younger people don't study history anymore, even the, the, the nearest history, 2008, uh, we had one of the, massive crisis in the world history. We started in the United States with the subprime, 
crisis and, and right. it's uh, like the domino effect it, it also induced the, the Lehman Brothers uh, the collapse of, of the Lehman Brothers and the private investment bond and this induced a massive economic collapse financial collapse all around the world like a, you know like a tsunami you know uh, and there are many many uh, side effects of that of course biggest financial institution in, in the world collapses and then the bank collapsed, the insurer collapsed, and the real economy also suffered very deeply by this crisis. So yeah. just to remind the people what happened. Fantastic. Happened. Thank you. Thank you for putting that in, because of course that builds the picture of the situation. So, and that's more or less when we met, when I was trying to do fundraising. And of course, uh, I, I had burnt through my cash file because I had made good money from Electromox, mm -hmm. a PC doctor, and I had poured all that money into Orbitus. So by that time, you know, we, we we had the platform ready, we had the product ready, and the product was really good. And the number of cu customers that we had that were using it, they were really happy and they were really raving about it. And they were uh, like, you know, this is the second best thing after a sliced bread. But all the new clients that we went to, they were like, oh, well, we have so many debts in the community and people are not paying the management fees because they've gone out of job or, you know, this is a second home and they can't afford the second home anymore. So there's, there was no way they could even pay for a website uh, that was, you know, nice to have and not a must to have. So until 2013, we were in a pretty difficult uh, sort of situation. But I, again, I knew all along that, you know, we, it, it's only a matter of time and the, you know, we were, pioneer, we were pioneering, we were the first ones in the market. So I, I waited until, you know, the problems of the financial situation were uh, resolved in Spain. And in 2013, I hired a sales manager and uh, luckily, and, you know, uh, Fortunately, we were able to then start selling. So 2013, we sold and we doubled on the previous year. And then 2014, we doubled a uh, number of users. We doubled in income uh, 15, 16, and 17. And uh, in 17, we received the uh, angel investor. And that was the beginning of ICO. Sorry, I'm no, going to no, have gone on. I will, I will put on the hold. Let me just put this on side. Okay, I'm back again. Right. So, so uh, okay, you you have the, you have uh, the interest of on the business hundreds. Okay. Business. So at that time, at so that just, time, just, just a question because you know uh, people maybe doesn't can't even figure out because uh, the the financial ecosystem into the, the the private company was also emerging at that time. Uh, business angel VC uh, before two thousand. 13 in Europe, in Latin Europe was something very uh, few. You know, there, there, there was so many in, in France. I remember uh, we started business on just clubs in, in France in 2007, 2008, but there was no, not, not so many people inside and they didn't, they were not used to invest in startups and they were very conservative. They wanted, you know, very profitable company, uh, etc. People were, were very new in the business. So, so 2013 in Spain, you have also the, at the center the emergence of you know the, the full ecosystem, right? True, but to be very honest, in 2013, the VCs that we went to, the seed VCs and the early stage VCs, uh, their the tickets they were talking about were like 10k, 50k, or the business essentials we talked about, you know, their tickets were 10K, uh, 25K, and it was like sums that, okay, what are we gonna do with that? Uh, and with valuation, that was uh, very unfair at that time because they yes. wanted a large piece of the cake, uh, with the smaller, small money, uh, yeah. but they were not used at that time how to do. Absolutely, mm. absolutely. I mean, now we're talking, you know, uh, down here in Malaga, uh, new venture capital has opened up, and they they invest tickets of a hundred thousand euros uh, in startups that are they only have an idea they don't, they yeah. hardly even have a product they don't have a client 
and at a valuation of 1 million euro. Uh, where, and it's, uh, you know, if you compare that to those days and to us, my God, then that would make us 10 million euros. Sure. The uh, thing that really evolved, and I think there's also uh, the, the boom of the personal uh, smartphones, you know, uh, that have completely changed the behavior of using internet uh, compared to laptop and personal computers. The, the smartphone has completely changed, smartphone and tablet, has completely changed the way we consume internet. Uh, even for business, for example, we talked about the VC. Uh, nowadays, a young entrepreneur uh, wants to launch an idea, uh, talk about a VC or an angel, if the VC or angel Propose him an unfair deal. You just look at the internet right now. What happened in the United States in front? Hey guys, you are you are unfair. Uh, look, look, uh, what happened elsewhere? I want the same deal, you know. Uh, and this has, in fact, a, a good impact on of, uh, of the ecosystem and how the deals are done right now. Big, big time, big time. I totally agree with you. And possibly that might have been one of uh, one thing that we fell behind. Mm. I, I have to say because we started when the mobile uh was not really a big thing mm -hmm. uh you know in 2008 and when the mobile was really into everything we didn't have a mobile version ready so it took us a number of years before we got our mobile app ready and we we got left behind there but i i have to say our expertise in the market made up for the lot uh the not having of the mobile app mm. so um and now with iWitches, you cover uh, a huge market in Spain, right? We we have a good foothold in local markets, so we have a very good uh, reputation. Mm -hmm. People do use us, people do use the software, and they're happy with it. And very interestingly enough, again, when I said, you know, I believe in following your passion, I, I, I took a two-year break after I sold my, you know, previous company, the PC doctor company. So I took a two-year break, and in this time, I helped entrepreneurs. But now I'm going back to Orbitus mm. uh, because it is my baby. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, you don't let your baby die. So And now suddenly things are really coming up again. An opportunity yeah, there, there are many new opportunities now, right now. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, and you also committed uh, strongly to, to support other entrepreneurs as a mentor or even as a business manager. Can you talk about a little bit about your your this this, uh, this activity and how you what you offer yeah. and what you give what you receive from the entrepreneur as a as a as a as a good feeling as a good feeling yeah I okay when I would I would say around about 2015 16 I started with exploring you know where I have gone wrong and you know what I need to do to uh, go forward. And it is when I actually come to that I needed to follow my passion. And uh, if I followed my passion, everything would just fall, to, you know, come together. Mm. So there is when I started giving a speech on follow your passion and passion and vision. And I started writing about it. I started talking about it. And I started doing this presentation for entrepreneurs. And bit by bit, you know, I started collaborating with a number of places where they would call me in as a judge. And in 2008, when I sold uh, PC Doctor, I then had a fair bit of time where I could help entrepreneurs more directly. And I would go in uh, when they had an idea and I would say, look, I've been through all of all of this and everything you say. So if you really want to succeed, you've really got to you know, be careful about a number of things. First of all, making sure you've got a minimum viable product not wasting your money, not wasting the business angels money, making sure that it is something you want to do, because if it's not something you want to do and you're just doing it for money down the line in three months, in five months time, you'll be tired because you're not going to make money immediately. Very seldom do entrepreneurs make, make, start making money like big time and, you know, it flies nine out of 10. It's a struggle. And I, I always, you know, compare it to climbing a mountain. You know, if your vision is climbing the mountain, you start on a path and sometimes this path takes you to a cliff. And the only way is come back down and choose another path. Uh, you know, if you enjoy going up the mountain, it doesn't really matter because you're enjoying the journey. 
and it's about enjoying the journey. Absolutely. So, and as far as you have the vision, you'll you'll reach that goal. So, uh, what's the next step right now for the real mind that you are, with full of ideas, full of projects, and because I think you're, you are never, uh, um, uh, how can I say, you are always hungry uh, of achieving new things, uh, creating new things. So, what's the next step for Dr. Parande? Right. I, I, I want to make Orbit's a su success. So the Orbit's history is not finished yet. So the chapter is not closed. And so I've got to know that I think I'm going to give it another five years and I'm going to give it all I have to make sure it's a success story. And that that is already starting to go in the right way. And things are coming together as I would have liked them to. So that, that, that goes forward. And equally, I want to help entrepreneurs. And you said, what do I get back from it? I, I think it's about giving to your community. It's about giving back to society uh, along the path uh, of entrepreneurship and my struggles and my uh, route on Orbitus, uh, on Orbitus. Many people helped me, many, many people. And one of them was you, Ari. Uh, I, I remember the nights we you know, used to Skype and used to tell me, you know, change your pitch deck like this and do this and do that. And this makes it better. So, and you gave freely, you know, you never asked for anything, not a single. You passion, know, you say this, passion. Uh, yeah. So it, it, it's about giving back to the community for what you have received, because uh, if we enrich our lives with, uh, experience and we give our experience to others then we make a better world it's about making a better world for everybody absolutely uh, i i love it i i enjoy it and i i enjoy it when i see other people succeed and i enjoy it when i see them uh progress in their work and get somewhere so that that is the biggest joy i can get or when i see that they have learned something just to conclude, if you had one, just one advice to, uh, let's say, a, a student in the STEM, in the STEM science, technology, engineering, and medicine, um, because this podcast is actually uh, dedicated to the STEM students, you know, to, to, to push them to, to, to commit into the, to the startup uh, world and to create their, their own, own, own history. Um, instead of waiting for an academic career and going uh, <laughs> academic career, uh, what would be just this one particular advice for them? I would say I've said this numerous times during this speech, and it's follow your heart, mm. follow your passion, don't follow money. <laughs> follow your passion, and money will follow you. Right. Uh, follow money and you'll be running after money and the money will be running away. Perfect. Perfect. That is my only advice and I really believe in it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for being with me today. It was a real pleasure to have, to have you doing this, uh, this uh, interview because you are such a real man and fantastic person. Uh, uh, I think your, your, your journey uh, and your story will, will uh, inspire so many young students to, to follow uh, your path, either. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you. It's always lovely speaking to you. I love it. You know, I enjoy our conversations, and you're always an inspiration to me. You too, man. You too. <laughs> Thank you.